Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet this evening and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, welcome to you all to this wonderful venue. Um, this is the fourth Bold Thinking uh, event of 2018. Since its launch in 2016, the Bold Thinking series has become an important forum for discussing significant contemporary issues. This year, Bold Thinking has considered topics as diverse as disability, diet, identity, and the rise of veganism. And last month's Forever Young uh, panel on aging, which we held at our Albury Wodonga campus. These are all topics in which La Trobe has an active research interest, and the Bold Thinking series provides a forum for us to share our research expertise with the broader community. So before I introduce tonight's panelists, let me make some brief remarks on this evening's topic. Uh, we're presenting tonight's event with our very good partner, Optus, and it's looking at something that can have an impact on all of us. It's something that we can expect to see more and more, given the fact that trends like globalization, data-driven decision-making, the agile economy, digitization, and automation show no signs of abating. In one sense, it's a very exciting time to be alive. We're connected with people around the globe more than ever before. We have access to an astonishing array of, array of data at our fingertips, and technology is changing our lives in ways that only a generation ago was the stuff of science fiction and fantasy novels. But while technology is having a tremendous positive influence on individuals and societies, it has brought with it some new and very diff difficult challenges. Challenges that are making us more vulnerable to privacy breaches, data misuse, and identity, th identity theft, and more susceptible to the next phishing, malware, or denial of service attack. New threats are emerging, like mobile phones ringing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Which reminds me, could you turn your phones to silent, please? Um, but while technology is having a tremendously positive influence, uh, there are new challenges, challenges that are making us more vulnerable in ways I've just described. New threats are emerging just as fast as we can respond to the ones we already know about. But luckily, there are experts, like tonight's panelists, who can help us to address these very powerful forces. All of our panelists are in their various ways at the front line of cybersecurity and privacy, and they will give us a behind the scenes glimpse into the dark world of cybercrime and other dimensions of the digital age, such as the new legal and ethical questions that face us. Um, before, I before I introduce them, it would be remiss of me not to mention that La Trobe has developed a fantastic undergraduate and master's degree in cybersecurity. So do pick up the brochure that you can find outside or check our website to find out more. Enough of that, on to tonight's panel. So I'm going to go from this end to the far end. Um, so starting uh, in, on my immediate left, Professor Jill Slay, AM, is the Optus Professor of Cybersecurity at La Trobe University and Director of Cyber Resilience Initiatives for the Australian Computer Society. She joined us from the Australian Centre for Cybersecurity in New South Wales and is undoubtedly one of the nation's leading experts on cybersecurity. She was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2011 for service to the technology industry, information technology industry through her contributions in forensic computer science, security, protection of infrastructure, and cyberterrorism. Moving one down, Professor David Watts is one of Australia's leading data protection at experts. He's an experienced regulator, policymaker, consultant, and lawyer, and he has taken on some of Australia's most complex privacy and data protection challenges. David is Professor of Information Law and Policy at La Trobe and the Task Force Leader on Big Data and Open Data for the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy and a Privacy Advisor to UN Global Pulse. Moving along, and I'm going to skip Elise in the middle and I'll come back to Elise in a moment. Um, Simon Ratcliffe is the Head of Cybersecurity at Optus with expertise in, in intelligence-driven information 
and Information Infrastructure Security Services. He's a graduate of Thames Valley University in London, has 30 years of experience in senior IT and corporate management roles, and has consulted for early stage startup and transformation businesses. And finally, but by no means least, Megan Haas is a cyber and forensic services partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. With more than 30 years experience in security, risk and privacy, Megan returned to Melbourne in 2017 after spending six years in Hong Kong. She works with clients to increase stakeholder governance of cybersecurity and privacy issues, corruption risks, anti-fraud programs, compliance and post-incident remediation. And to corral all of this talent and expertise, I'm delighted that we're joined tonight by award-winning ABC journalist, Elise Morgan. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elise and tonight's panelists. And I'll hand over to Elise to get things going. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. So digital defenders, who is guarding us from attack? Well, I suppose to start off, we should actually identify what the issues are and what the problems are. And Jill, I'll start with you. Are we, from a government perspective, under attack? <sighs> yes. Um, why are we under attack? I'll give you the professor's answer, okay. Um, Unfortunately, we became reliant on an infrastructure, I mean the internet, which was designed uh, for by academics, I believe, or possibly in the American army, for file sharing in, in an insecure way. So we designed an infrastructure so that we could share data and information. And afterwards, we, we have connected our critical infrastructure to it. We've dumped, as it were, all our data on it about people like us spend our lives working out from different perspectives how to secure this infrastructure which was um, just never designed for the purpose it's being used for today. That's how I, I interpret it. You have the most amazing insight into essentially the forefront of the war, yeah. uh, consulting with the ADF, you're in ADFA, you're in the government. What's it like inside our biggest and most important institutions? There was once a Four Corners program with, at my previous university with my previous students, and we acted out, and you can probably find it somewhere, but it's, it is a war, and we acted it out with a critical infrastructure showing the kind of command line programming at the speed of attack. So it's shh, and it's coming at you, and it's coming at you all the time. It's coming at you really, really fast, and you have no idea what's in that stream of data. You don't know if it's malware. You don't know if you've got the kinds of protection in your own system to keep it out. And uh, I think Simon knows this as well as I do, because he, he deals with it in real life. There's a sense in which I'm one step removed from the problem, because I spend my life um, as the explainer. I explain it to people who uh, have policy backgrounds, <laughs> have law backgrounds, sorry, um, who are soldiers or who have uh, very much uh, policy jobs to try to say, this is the context, and into this context, you must create our international policy, our domestic policy, and this is the context in which you need to defend us from a real enemy, which we cannot always define. Who Are we currently under attack? As we sit here right now, are there people out there trying to attack into or get into our most... Yes, important yeah. institutions. Yes, they will be, uh, but I'm a technologist, so we're not. The way I see it is that, regardless of who I am, I could be um, a 15-year-old or a 10-year-old script kiddie who's learned how to do this. I could be uh, organised crime. I could be uh, a terrorist, or I could be a nation state who really wants to attack Australia. But I will largely be using the same technology. And if you saw my activity on the internet, you wouldn't be easily be able to determine which one of them I was. So, so either you could call me a cyber criminal, you could call me a cyber terrorist, or you could call me a freedom fighter. But the effect on your system would be roughly the same. 
I, I was going to add that, uh, I mean, the reason why uh, we're, we're all being attacked is because it's possible. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a goal, there's a prize uh, at the, uh, or the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you look at the Australian Signals Directorate, uh, which is our own uh, signals intelligence organisation, their, their mantra, their, their logo on their website is uh, reveal their secrets, protect our own. And so they're now out proudly saying that they're out there to go and reveal other people's secrets and obviously help us protect our own. But the reason for that is that there's a, a very good return on investment. And what I mean by that is uh, traditionally if you wanted uh, to engage in some kind of espionage, you would need to send somebody into a hostile environment where they potentially were going to get trapped, tortured and killed. And now you can go and get that information remotely uh, using cyber hacking techniques. So in the same way that our government is quite happy to pronounce that they are there to reveal secrets and protect our own, we must expect that uh, there are threat actors uh, out there doing exactly the same for us or to us. Simon, uh, well, sorry, Elise, but one of, the, one of the things that flows from what you're saying, Simon, is um, that word scalability. And we talk about it a lot in IT. Um, but what, it mean, what, that, what scalability means in cybersecurity is, if you want to compare it to, to uh, um, being burgled, um, instead of having one burglar outside your door, you've got all the burglars outside your door. You've got the best burglars outside <laughs> your door. And they're there all the time. Yeah. They're there all the time. And that's what scalability means um, when it comes to cyber threats. So they are at our doorstep um, constantly, and the best of them are. So let's break it down. We've got the government... We, we know that the ADF, you're working with them to, to defend our... To to defend our most important institutions. Megan, from a business perspective, how exposed are businesses from the array of criminals that are at the door? Uh, increasingly exposed. So businesses are evolving. Um, the design of new services and products, you know, customer-centric design. So we're trying to make it easier f to engage with our customers to buy and sell products and services. So therefore, that's opening up the door to a wider array of, you know, um, potential attack vectors. So um, with the internet of things and with the ease of use, you can imagine all of those robbers lined up outside the door, all um, focused on um, a product that has been designed not with security forefront of mind, but with ease of use. So they are increasingly worried. And so do you think because of that push to make, you know, cyber retail, um, you know, connectivity with, you know, all services mm -hmm. now, for example, all have web chats available on their mm -hmm. websites immediately mm -hmm. for you to speak to them, is all of that sort of ease of use uh, making businesses more exposed? Uh, absolutely. Inherently, yes, it must be. So the challenge, I think, for um, the, each organisation is to understand what it is that they need to be protecting um, and then drive a program of when and how and who, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But understanding, you know, what it is that, that um, would be potentially of interest to a bad guy. So if we don't know who's on the other side, if it's organised crime, what are they after? What can be converted into cash? If it's a nation state, you know, um, corporate, you know, seek espionage and, you know, blueprints, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's understanding what it is that could be a target and then starting to break that down and think about how we go about um, a strategy for protection. Simon, I guess from a telco's perspective, how exposed is the whole network? I mean, there's a lot of talk at the moment about uh, you know the potential of a cyber tsunami, uh, which is very dramatic. Um, what do you mean by cyber tsunami? Um, a uh, a massive attack, uh, the the likes of which we haven't seen before. So, uh, sort of, if if you consider, uh, for example, the uh, the Internet of Things (IoT), um, uh, to to Megan's point, you know, if you think about uh, uh, this concept of moving at the speed of business, 
what organizations are trying to do is get new products and services to market as quickly as possible and security becomes a, uh, a bit of an afterthought. Uh, and so if you think about uh, you know, the Internet of Things, all the devices that are being connected to the Internet, in a lot of cases it's the minimal viable product. And so these things haven't been thought through uh, from a uh, cybersecurity perspective and we deploy them uh, and they become uh, you know, cyber weaponry. Uh, so you know, the concern from a, a global telco perspective is the mass exploitation of these devices uh, to a point where they clog the internet. Mm. So they all start beaconing, making a lot of noise all at one time, uh, and then we have to deal with that huge uh, volume of, uh, of traffic. Uh, and so um, that, that is a, you know, a significant threat. And we are seeing you know, these new internet connected devices uh, being exploited because, again, they can be. Uh, I, I guess the audience may have heard recently about um, the uh, a casino which was hacked. Uh, they decided mm. in their high rollers room to put uh, a nice aquarium with a lot of expensive fish in it. And so to protect those expensive fish, they put in a thermometer to make sure that the water was the, uh, the right temperature. Um, and, of course, they wanted to know back at base whether the water was the right temperature, so they connected it to the Internet. Um, but they also connected it to the same wireless network. That was where the High Rollers database was. And so some enterprising hacker realized that this thermometer was uh, vulnerable, hacked the thermometer, stole the High Rollers database in this casino. And so what we're seeing is these devices are easy to hack, uh, and of course they become a, a considerable threat, uh, not just in terms of stealing High Roller databases, but being used as mass weaponry to take out, uh, uh, take out the internet. Uh, and we've certainly seen uh, uh, you know, considerable peaks in traffic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, uh, Optus was uh, recently awarded uh, the rights to um, do the, um, create the network for the Commonwealth Games. Uh, and we knew we would be subject to attack. We knew that there were going to be uh, likely hacktivists who were going to uh, target our network. Uh, and so we were ready. We were looking for these things which we call distributed denial of service attacks where these devices actually try and clog uh, our networks to prevent the broadcast. And you know, in this case, it was to 1.5 billion viewers. So we really wanted to be on our game. Um, we were fortunate, uh, unlike the uh, Olympics, uh, which was attacked, uh, we didn't see significant attacks, but we did have some mm. palpitations for a little while where um, we saw a huge surge in traffic and we're thinking, oh my goodness me, we're under attack. Uh, fortunately, it turned out that Sony was doing a huge PlayStation yeah. upgrade <laughs> on the same night as the opening ceremony, so we were able to uh, address that. Uh... I'm glad you didn't shut that down. There would have been some very angry gamers <laughs> who may have then hacked yes, you. Yes, yes, we may have shaped them a little bit. But, what, uh... what was the Winter Olympics example? Um, uh, they, they were attacked, I believe, uh, uh, so, uh, in, in terms of the threat actors, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, organised crime and state-sponsored and you mm. know, the, the individuals, but there are still hacktivists out there. Uh, and so there are uh, organisations, uh, folks who want to highlight a particular issue, draw attention to themselves, uh, and those are the sorts of organisations which attack things like the Commonwealth Games and the Olympics. And we believe that the Olympics were attacked by uh, a hacktivist this group, but uh, I don't know much uh, in terms of the details of it. So we know that there's plenty of people out there, and uh, I mean, the aquarium example <laughs> is yes. just so beautiful because there's so many households that have so many innocent pieces of technology in their, in their homes, in their lives, and yet they can be used. How exposed is the individual and, and households? Well, it seems like Alexa spies on people <laughs> and, uh, and uh, reports their conversations. Um, and, uh, of course, those, those sort of intelligence agents that are being in increasingly embodied in uh, our smartphones and the things that we buy uh, for home um, are, uh, are listening to us. And, uh, you know, I ask myself... Um, are they just listening for our command to say, you know, wake up Siri or whatever it is? Um, or do they or can they be used? Well, they can be used, obviously, to record conversations. Um, and the question is, what sort of security is built into that? Um, do you think there's much awareness within 
households and the general population of the of how exposed they are? I'm, it's really hard to be general about that. I think there are there are people who are aware of these things, um, and then there's a, a whole bunch of people who might be aware of them, but really they're looking for the convenience of the device that they're using. Um, and, and so they're really prioritising that. Um, and then there are, there are others who really just don't understand. And so I think it, it, it's important to sort of look at, you know, various groups of people within society who, who might look at those sorts of things and be worried about it. I mean, some people are worried about Facebook tracking them. Yeah. Um, others see the convenience of Facebook and don't worry so much about it. Um, but... Uh, and, and, and that raises issues about what we can do. Like, you, what we can do as just individuals. And it's really hard with something like um, Alexa to turn it off or to know it's been turned off. Like, you can, you can do good things with your passwords. You can um, make sure that you don't put in P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D um, into your passwords. Um, and you can use complex passwords. You can do a whole range of things. You can make sure that your computers are always updated. You can make sure that um, your operating systems are always updated. The usual um, recommended things to, to do for good uh, security hygiene. Um, but when it comes to your mobile phone listening to you, that's another order of magnitude. Is it ever a fair, fair trade to trade in a bit of privacy or security for convenience? Well, I would say no to that. Um, um, and, and, and I think one of the things that we've seen recently is what some of the consequences of this can be. So Cambridge Analytica is a, a great example of that, of Facebook providing your information to um, an organisation that weaponised that information so that um, you could be targeted for political advertising. Um, and arguably, that's a new security risk vector. That is content. Content that's designed to manipulate you. Content that's designed to provoke certain actions in you. Or content simply designed to confirm your existing biases and make them worse. Um, and... So I mean that's one of the one of the one of the outcomes with that. Um, for me, not being a, ever a Facebook user and not ever having had Facebook, it's not something that I'm willing to trade. Um, but a lot of people are. At the same time, you know, Facebook's a bit boring these days. My kids say, you know, that's something for grandma and granddad. Yeah, really, as soon as the granddads just, get on it, you're yeah, off. It's really boring. The young and, people are off. And, and I understand Instagram's getting a bit like that too. Too many parents monitoring kids. So, um, but different people make different decisions about mm. that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and I wonder, you know, how much, how, how informed they are. And I wonder how much trust, just blind trust, that they put in a lot of the providers. I'm assuming that no one on the panel has Alexa or Google Home. <laughs> no, I, I would love to have it, but I, I'm sacrificing the convenience for the security and I'm influenced by my own research because I'm actually a professor of forensics, so if I have to review papers, it's always about from PhD students who are doing the forensics and the anti-forensics and the anti-anti-forensics <laughs> where they claim that nothing is secure and I guess I agree with them. Mm. Um, but I would actually love to have one of those Alexa kind of devices. I would love it just to play with it, but I'm not going to do so. What would you get it to do, Jill? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I would get... I want something that's going to turn the lights on outside, right? <laughs> and I want something that I can control things in my house from a distance through my phone, but I'm not going to buy anything because I won't trust the security. And thus, I will never use it. And I only have Facebook. I have it very much locked down because I know how to do that. But that's only to watch what my kids are up to. <laughs> <laughs> Good forensics. Let's take a look at who exactly is the enemy. I mean, we touched on it before. Jill, to start off with you, because you do have that sort of defence and, and government background, I mean, recently there was that huge expose that we found a secret military base because some of the guys there used Strava while they were running around it. Yes. Is the biggest enemy to organisations 
the people within them doing dumb stuff. I thought that was a great example of dumb stuff, but I can tell you of more historic dumb stuff. Um, when we first started connecting the critical infrastructure to the internet, we then allowed uh, the potential of attacking um, power stations and water, water facilities uh, through the internet. And the f we had the Maruchi Shire water incident of 2001, which was, was the, meant to be the first attack on critical infrastructure. Was that the Noosa sewer? Yeah, that was a, a sort of sewage flowing in the streets of Noosa. Uh, and I went on a training course in America at the time, and essentially the Americans had mapped all their critical infrastructure, and they had it all on the internet, and they all had it totally visible for the whole <laughs> of the world to see all of their critical infrastructure. So they, they slowly took it down, because at the time it was um, popular to advertise, you know, look at what we've got and look at how connected it is. But you, you can't go and Google all that kind of, of, of stuff now. So, um, yes... Yeah, we, we've learned lots of things about it, but we, everything is a potential target. Of course, Stuxnet attacked critical infrastructure, really. And, and of course, the threats don't need to be that sophisticated. Um, so Stuxnet uh, that Jill is talking about uh, was uh, an amazing concoction by the US uh, and Israel to um, uh, delay uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear enrichment uh, program um, and very, very sophisticated code. But uh, unfortunately, uh, when you look at some of the vulnerabilities within critical infrastructure, um, uh, some of this stuff is really old. Yeah. It's really, really clunky old stuff. And uh, if you guys you know, remember, I used to be really irritated for my parents. I used to flick the light switch on and off. I used to flick the switch, flick the switch, and eventually the light bulb would blow. And so uh, that's, that's quite similar. I'm an irritating kid. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of similar with uh, some uh, critical infrastructure where all you need to be able to do is remotely get to the on-off switch of some of these big, old, clunky pieces of equipment and switch it on, switch it off, switch it on, switch it off, and eventually get confu uh, gets confused uh, and crashes. And so potentially just access to some of those critical systems, all you need to be able to do is reach it and turn off the switch uh, a few times and you can destroy it. And so that's not sophisticated. And there's so much talk about sophisticated attacks. And unfortunately, most of the attacks we see are not sophisticated at all. It's just a matter of gaining access and then being able to do your damage. So, Jill, you work with both ASX listed companies and then small companies. Who is the biggest enemy to these, to these organisations? Uh, organised crime, I think. From uh, if if we discount the insider, because mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, you know that they are the weakest link, as it were. Our employees, they also know where our our vulnerabilities are from a process and control perspective, because mm -hmm. they're already inside the tent. Um, if we uh, exclude the insiders, then it is, you know, people who are looking to make a buck. Now, whether that's, you know, depending, um, that could be um, an individual or it could be quite literally organised crime. Um, and there are many, many different ways to, to gain entree. And we have uh, every organisation potentially vulnerable from the sole trader right up through the, uh, the ASX listed. Is it true, uh, there's this rumour out there that there are multiple ASX big companies ASX listed big companies who have been ransomed multiple times over consumer data. Is it true? I will refer you to my government colleague. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have actually no idea. Um, but I would, if, just because I've got a good imagination, I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> you would think it would be likely? I would think it would be very likely. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, if, I can only think of... Anecdotal stories of people like Arnott's Biscuits being ransom. That was some time ago. Mm. I'm good with historic data. But um, I'm very uncomfortable about talking about mm. current things. Mm. Uh, but we can assume that many, many companies have and they've chosen not to report it because that's why the stats on cyber breaches are so hard to, um, to use, even if you can collect them, because there's all the un unreported incidents. Historically, absolutely. But I think... Um, we are now in a new time of the uh, mandatory disclosure, yeah, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that these mandatory disclosure laws will change how much we know about what's going on? Let me answer that question in a second. Um, 
So let's talk about health. Um, so there are three main practice management software suites for um, general practitioners in Australia. Uh, one of them was um, known for being particularly susceptible to ransomware um, and was ransomed countless times. And countless medical practices have ransomed their information back. Um, and the whole health sector, if you think it's um, so filled with connections between various systems, mm -hmm. there are multiple entry points. Um, as Simon was saying, a lot of it is really old, clunky stuff that um, was developed in green screen times. Um, so, yes, it, has, it, it, it certainly has happened. Will data breach notification um, um, affect that? It's going to be a serious data breach. Um, uh, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner has received, or had received before last budget, almost nothing to implement it. Um, and I think they might have received a little bit of extra, inf um, extra funding to deal with it. Um, but I think the significance of data breach notification is going to come when we start thinking about consequences. Because one of the reasons we don't do security well is because there are no consequences. What you can do is, is and I'm, I'm just about to read to you from a, a Commonwealth Bank um, press release, mm. um, which I think we really, really says everything about security in the private sector. Um, one of, the key, one of the key problems is that there are no consequences. And until there are consequences, until there's something more than saying, we take your security very seriously, and you don't, um, this is just going to continue to happen. So let me, can I, am I allowed this to read is, from Commonwealth Oh, ab absolutely. This is, so to, to give the background, this is from uh, the statement that was released by the Commonwealth Bank after those two big tapes yep. uh, were lost. Yep. They think. Yep. They may have been destroyed. Or I'm sure the audience remembers this. A couple of weeks ago, the Commonwealth Bank came out and said, well, it was, it was divulged by the media and then CBA had to admit to it, that they'd lost two giant tapes with tens of thousands of customers' data on it, uh, no passwords and no account actual details were lost. However, there was a lot of information about the individual customers and they don't know where the tapes went. So 20, 20 million, 20 million records. Oh, that's sorry. almost. Yeah, that's oh, way sorry. more. Than, sorry. sorry, 20 19, million. <laughs> 19, 19 point eight. Sorry, I've exaggerated <laughs> a bit. But 20 million records. And how many people live in Australia? 24, something like that. So <laughs> it, here's what they said: No evidence was found of any customer information being compromised. Um, they said that. Ongoing monitoring of the 19.8 19 million customer accounts involved remains in place. Customers' passwords and pins were not affected. Customers do not have to change their passwords or pins. And the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and the Australian Prudential Reg Regulation Authority were both notified of the incident at the time um, and provided with briefings. The decision not to notify customers was made in the light of the investigation's findings and the account monitoring in place, and there was an independent forensic um, investigation. Now, uh, uh, it goes on to say we take your security very seriously. Um, <laughs> um, so the tapes appear to have dropped off the back of the truck. That's what KPMG guess at. They're not certain of it, though. Um, um, Customers, uh, this, is, this is the critical phrase, customers' passwords and pins were not affected by this incident. What the bank is concerned about is, um, is customer passwords, pins and account numbers because when they are lost, the bank becomes liable under its own voluntary schemes. Mm -hmm. So when it's for any money lost. Yeah, the, the, the bank, in other words, the bank is saying, hip hip hooray, we didn't lose any money. But when you when you when you when you parse this this press release properly, they're saying, "Thank God we didn't lose any money." And it's really important that we didn't lose any money. We we actually spoke to the regulators, and apparently the regulators didn't think that 19.8 million 
customer rec records was a serious security incident, which is just astonishing. And you really wonder what our regulators are doing um, and you know, about how they define the word serious. So I've been a regulator, and let me assure you, I would have defined 19.8 million customer accounts as serious and something that um, should have been revealed and people should have known about. So and just to jump in there, I mean, they're saying that no passwords, pins, accounts were, were hacked or, or, or anything else. But it leads you to believe that perhaps if those tapes have ended up not being destroyed on the side of a highway somewhere mm. as someone's run over it, um, someone could have 19.8 million dates of birth, uh, full names, addresses, yeah. account history, Absolutely. what you've been buying on the internet, etc., that you might not want people to know about, etc. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, so do we need to fear, as consumers, do we need to fear those that have our information, that we trust with our information the absolutely, most, we or need do we them. need to fear the people who are trying to steal it off us? Both of them, really. Um, um, particularly with this sort of cultural attitude of, you know, we take your security very seriously. Because, you know, many corporations don't. I mean, I've regulated security in Victoria Police. Um, you'd think that, you know, security was there, it was good there. It was pretty bad. Um, and, you know, again, a lot of infrastructure What's, really what's an odd. example? OK. Um, um, a... Um, a secure facility that Victoria Police had access to, that had access, the facility had access into um, um, secure Commonwealth databases. And the physical security um, on the door was one of those push button pads where you had to press the buttons and then you could get in. Um, but the police couldn't remember it. And so what they did was they wrote the code, the, the, the combination out on a yellow sticky piece of paper and put it next to, put it next to, put it next to the button. When the Commonwealth, you'd be pleased to know this, Jill, when the Commonwealth came to audit it, they went completely mad. But Victoria Police didn't see anything wrong with that. Um, there have been occasions, I mean, I'm not telling you anything that isn't public. Um, there have been occasions where, um, uh, you know, organised crime has been facilitated by Victoria Police officers um, who borrowed passwords from their friends. You know, I, I can't remember my password into the Interpose intelligence system and I no longer have uh, access to it, probably because I'm under investigation for <laughs> professional standards uh, <laughs> command. Oh, um, and, uh, and can you let me have... Mate, can you let me have... Uh, can you let me have your password? Oh, can I can I build on this? Plenty of times. Uh, critical infrastructure. I used to live in South Australia. I won't name the critical infrastructure, but some of these systems they still run on a sort of cut down version of Windows 3.1. Yeah. And they have uh, only have shared passwords, so everybody has to know the password. Uh, but because they're safety critical systems, they stick it on the yellow sticky on the screen because in case of an emergency, we all have to get in here. So there is actually no password, uh, but, but it's safety critical, so it's okay to not really have a password. Uh, and and. <laughs> You're hitting your head on a brick wall if you try to talk about anything else because you're talk when you're talking about a critical infrastructure, you're usually talking about the availability of a service and, and, and there is a regulator who wants that service to be available, whatever it is. And thus, you cannot have the... Um, and they see me as the IT person, so you can't have the IT person's argument about the password because they are engineers. And even if I put my engineer hat on, I cannot convince them about the insecurity so I've learnt with that community that security to them means the availability of a service and cyber security is not security in, in their domain. Uh, and um, I just put that in the too hard basket because if I'm going to come up with you know, sensible research-based solutions to the, secure, the cyber security of their systems, then they're not going to actually operate in a sensible way with the operating system, i.e., yeah. So we, um, Megan, I hope that it's a little bit more yeah. secure in corporate Australia. I was about to say, <laughs> um, 
So we are uh, doing a lot more work at the moment with organisations around the security of operational technologies mm -hmm. and um, helping them to test out that security through um, pe penetration testing, so trying to hack in, um, putting ourselves in the shoes of, of the threat actor and trying to get in and then working with our clients around it. It's, it's a growing industry, in fact, because we have critical infrastructure with the ageing technologies and the challenges that go along with that. But equally, we have the Internet of Things and some of the new products and services, same thing, operational technologies. And it requires um, a different approach and a different way of tackling the problem. Has mandatory reporting sharpened uh, the attention and the focus of business yep. leaders on this issue? Yeah, absolutely. Are they now taking it a lot more seriously? <laughs> well, I don't know as a consequence of uh, the mandatory reporting because it's still very young. So um, I think we saw at the end of the first quarter post uh, the mandatory reporting going live, um, there was um, a significant uptick in the number of reports. And I think... Um, don't quote me exactly, but something around 63, I think, incidences in um, in the six weeks since mandatory reporting um, went live, as opposed to some 114 mm. for the entire 2016-2017 financial year. So you can see six weeks, 12 months. <laughs> Um, and many of those were health-related, um, as, as David was suggesting earlier. But I think, um, you know, consumers and customers are going to be turning to their biz, you know, the businesses that they deal with and that they would like to trust, and say, "Hey, what are you doing?" Before we take a look at, at the solutions, I just want to take a look at some of the major issues that are currently, you know, in, in the news and, and in front of us. And one of the major ones is Huawei. We've now got senior Liberals calling for it to be banned from bidding on the 5G network that's going to be built out in Australia. Should Huawei be banned? Um, I will pass this question to my friend here who has... <laughs> the Chinese legislation with him. Uh -huh. And I want to uh, give Optus uh, a okay. nice let out of this problem by saying that uh, Australia, uh, the Australian government should have thought about Huawei in much greater depth a longer time ago. Um, uh, and because actually uh, the legislation, the Chinese legislation makes it very clear that any company which has got such a um, a connection to the Chinese government uh, is a problem for us. So Article 7 of the 2017 Chinese National Intelligence Law says, all organisations and citizens shall, in accordance with the law, support, cooperate with and collaborate in, in, in national intelligence work and guard the secrecy of national intelligence work they are aware of. The state will protect individuals and organisations that support, cooperate with and collaborate in national intelligence work. And really, that's the end of the story. Simple. <laughs> so. Huawei, Huawei has to report back on anything that we, that we might do in Australia or England, um, which is where they started, to the Chinese government. It, it, uh, it's a duty of a private sector organisation to undertake... Um, um, national security tasks, which could be espionage, which could, which could be a whole range of different things. It is a legal duty. Um, so I, I think that's sort of the end of it, really. Simon? The, the challenge is actually very broad and uh, it's, it's a very old challenge. Just to um, come back to um, Jill's earlier comment about Stuxnet, uh, the, the details of that Stuxnet attack was that the, uh, the core... Um, uh, vulnerability was identified before the product was even shipped into Iran. Uh, and so there was a clear understanding of the supply chain uh, that was going to service uh, the Iranian nuclear program. And so those systems were understood and compromised to some extent before uh, they were even built into the, uh, into the program. And so if you actually look at uh, the supply chain issues that we have across the board with all of these new technologies. If you are a very forward-thinking uh, state uh, organization, uh, then you have the opportunity to interfere with the supply chain and seed uh, these vulnerabilities um, way, way, way before 
uh, anyone implements them. And so that's certainly a significant threat for all of us uh, to ensure that uh, the technologies that we're adopting are thoroughly tested. So we're looking at every aspect of understanding those technologies um, and making sure that we test them because we've, we've even seen that um, with VW, uh, there are some technologies that are actually smart enough to understand, oh, hello, I'm being tested here and change their behavior. Uh, you'd, you'd be aware of the uh, emissions uh, challenge that, uh, that VW had. So we've got to be able to really thoroughly understand these systems, test them, uh, and take a, a, a virtual zero trust uh, approach to everything that we import uh, and utilize, uh, in, uh, certainly in the custodians of critical infrastructure. Um, I was having dinner with a very nerdy friend of mine last night, and uh, he was telling me with great glee about this chipset that he was buying out of China. And uh, China was buying these chips and putting them on a chip board, and he was now using them for his uh, home automation. And uh, I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and he, he was reveling in how Is cheap... this the nerdy version of buying Alexa? Uh, building it yourself. <laughs> yes, absolutely. He wants to automate everything in his home. But he's buying these things from China. And uh, he was wondering why they were so cheap. So I suggested to him that maybe they're sort of cross-subsidised in some way uh, and uh, made very freely available to us. So, yeah, the, the, the problem is way broader. Obviously, Huawei is in the spotlight, uh, but I think we, you know, we need to floodlight this to a certain extent and look at everything that we're, uh, we're implementing. And it's become a political argument, you see, because the previous big argument was with the American government and Kaspersky, mm -hmm. as, which is a Russian company, which I see more as a software company rather than hardware. Um, but basically, can Kaspersky use their software? And they are security people, but they're known to have links to the KGB, to Putin and all the rest of it. But there seem to be... Um, it's just being used as a political weapon. So you get to the stage. Because I wanted to buy a new computer, and I wanted to buy one which was not made in China. Uh, I found one called Asus. Asus are made in Taiwan. Where do they get the chips from, she asks herself. And so... Everything I want to buy is, has got Chinese chips in. So do we need to be that paranoid? Um, yeah, well, I'm, a par I'm that paranoid. Oh, uh, because so am I. Oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> Simon and I are that paranoid. Do we, do we all need to be that paranoid? Well, I wasn't. Do no, each, I... Does each country need to be well, building it... its own technology and its own chips? Well, uh, the, the, I suppose the point is... Um, Somebody like me, I'm paranoid about my intellectual property and I don't want somebody stealing it from my computer and therefore I, I don't want them to get it via a chip which is, which is sort of compromised. I wondered about compromised chips until I, I was with my mentor who's an American professor at Idaho State University and with an electron microscope he showed me how the chips are compromised. So I, I've seen with my own eyes that nobody is making up stories. They really got chips where they can listen in, like phone, phone, home, phone home chips, you know, they just phone home and tell, tell somebody at home what, what's going on in my computer. So after that, um, I got a little bit careful, but I cannot, I cannot do anything about everybody's supply chain. It's, it's real. We'll take a look at some of the solutions now. We've, we've covered mandatory breach reporting, which goes so far. What other legislation do we need? One of the things that we do need is to recognise that there can be consequences. Um, so, uh, with our last sort of revolution, the Industrial Revolution, there were no laws about occupational health and safety and stuff like that. So, people worked in appalling conditions until we caught up with it and there were consequences for, for um, bad behaviour. Um, so I, I think there, there are consequences, but our lawyers really have lacked the imagination um, um, to construct or to, to, take, to take the issues on. So our I, lawyers or our regulators? Both, really. Um, our lawyers in the sense that... Um, I would say that there's a, a law of information security that sits there, that sort of sits in plain sight, mm -hmm. but hasn't actually been recognised. So it's um, a combination of breach of statutory duty, negligence, but importantly for corporate Australia, breach of fiduciary duties by directors. 
So if you've got an information business and, and, and your job as a director is to manage risk and you're not managing risk um, around your information assets and your share price plummets, mm. time for a class action. Have we got any lawyers in the audience tonight? Please, um, think about it. Um, so th there, there is a combination. <laughs> there is a combination. And I've actually sat in a you know, firm of lawyers in New York and said to them, you know, what do you do in this area? And they said, come here, we'll show you the suits we're filing this afternoon. All class actions um, are all based on um, breach of security. We haven't done it. Unfortunately, um, um, for a combination of reasons, our regulators haven't really been active in this area. Um, Is that because we haven't known? I mean... We've heard tonight that there's probably a lot more breaches going on than we know about. I think... Um, what can the regulators do if they don't know? Um, it's their job to find out. Um, so you actually go and find out. You go and talk to pe the people on the panel um, and find out what the risks are and get yourself equipped and um, invest in upskilling your knowledge about this sort of stuff. But I think what we've found also is that regulators don't have enough money to do that. They're not resourced for it. The Australian Information Commissioner is really quite badly resourced. Um, and I also think, as the Banking Royal Commission has shown us, that we're suffering from a bit of regulatory capture. Um, and um, you know, because of lack of resources, lack of information, lack of skills, I think regulators have been, I'm groping for the word, is supine the right word? Um, who re really have not done, um, have not, have, they've been reactive rather than proactive. And uh, uh, like to, to, to let 19.8 million lost banking records through to the keeper. Like, With no earth did they have in their mind? We're sitting here in the, in the glare of La Trobe University's banner. Are there, you just mentioned skills, are there enough skilled people out there to arm, uh, you know, the, the regulators' offices, to arm, you know, the defence okay. force and the government and, and all these different bodies out no, there? They're, they're not. So the, the conservative figures would say that to remain the status quo, we need about 9,000 more people involved in this in the, um, the next five Five years. Uh, globally, somewhere between 1.2 million and 2 million, depending on whose report you read. Um, and if you look at all the universities who were involved in this, um, many of us still teach a curriculum which is uh, largely mathematical, um, just networking, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, but some graduates of places where I've worked uh, are not going to be very much help in the workforce. They just need a lot more training when you get them in the workforce. Um, we have some, there are some, some good things happening. So in the TAFE colleges, there's the bo what's being called the Box Hill model, which has got a cert for and an advanced diploma, which is going to have people at the technologist level. There's universities like our own, uh, which are getting the three-year sort of multidisciplinary cyber degree plus the very specialised master's programmes. But even if you can do the mathematics yourself, that doesn't add up to 9,000. Um, for the Australian Computer Society, I've just led a whole piece of work in, in developing the prof professional standards because um, it was Prime Minister and Cabinet, really, well, Alistair McGibbon mm. in his old role, who said, Jill, can you just please tell me what cyber security is and what is a cyber security professional? So I led a task force. So we actually defined cyber security uh, because I was an engineer. Engineers know what engineers do. Lawyers know what lawyers do. But apparently, we have never known what cyber security professionals do. So we now do. And then we can then um, we can accredit degree programs and say, yes, this is cyber security, and no, this is not cyber security. So I've been putting frameworks in, because that's where my mind goes, but we're just not pumping enough students into it, because we've traditionally wanted them to have mathematics, and we haven't been teaching enough STEM in schools. So that's, that's, that's the hurdle. And I'll be, what I was doing when I was working at ADFA was essentially training soldiers, doing the same thing. Training senior officers to get PhDs, 
junior ones with honours and middling ones with master's degrees and, and then a whole lot of them getting just undergraduate degrees. So I've been pushing people down the pipeline because that seemed a really good solution. But I know that even if you count me and people at Edith Cowan and QUT, the ones who are passionate, we still haven't created enough. Megan, you use these graduates to stress test Mm -hmm. uh, companies' mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. How do you go finding them? Hmm. Um, well, it's not as easy as I'd like. Um, to to it, it's a combination, I think, of of baseline technical skills and then the the right mindset. So we need curiosity. Yes. Um, we need people who are competitive because if I give them a target, they'll try and hit it. And so there's that, here's a problem statement, here's a challenge. Can you find a way in or around or over or under? And so it's, it's a really broad skill set that I'm after from the, the you know, the IQ and the, the EQ, quite mm -hmm. frankly, because, you know, the, the, the only difference between um, a bad hacker and a good hacker is, is heart and mm. values. And how do you pick that? Because, uh, <laughs> I mean, how do you ensure that these people that you're training up and you're putting in a position of immense power and responsibility, go hack into this company and, and tell me how we can stop it. Not go hack into this company, then go home and figure out how to drain their bank account. Um, <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you find that right person? How do you trust these people? Well, we, <laughs> we, we work as a team and uh, when one is um, conducting penetration um, testing um, with a view to, to identifying where potential weaknesses are, we are extraordinarily careful for obvious reasons. Um, and, you know, the, the last thing we want in the, in the case of um, operational technologies, which we have discussed and agreed are older and um, arguably easier, um, if we break something, that could have quite catastrophic yeah. um, consequences from a critical infrastructure. So there's a whole um, a myriad of checks and balances that we put in place and that we set up quite clearly um, the governance around, you know, our efforts. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, um, the, the individuals themselves, look, you know, we, we have um, our... Uh, our recruitment programs, we have our training programs, we spend a lot of time working together as a team um, and we do get to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, you know, I think the people that want to work for an organisation such as mine are passionate about helping um, strengthen you know, the, um, the perimeter and making mm. it harder for the bad guys because it is about, you know, that emotional quotient and, and their values to do the right thing. And very, very quickly, Jill, because I, I, I know we've got to go to questions, but I just wanted to ask you, I mean, are we doing enough and what more do we need to do to get um, these highly skilled, essentially children that are at home... I mean, they're like young teenagers and just figuring out what they can do on the internet and they're getting into places that are extraordinary. How do you identify them and bring them in into the good club before they go into the bad club? I think I told you I had a work experience student at a year 10, age 15, and I just sat in with my PhD students and he seemed to know the same things as my PhD students. <laughs> he seemed to be just as intelligent. And it did strike me, what is this kid going to do for about the next eight years mm -hmm. while, while we wait for him to catch up? Um, a friend of mine who's a professor in Tulsa, he had a, a, a program sponsored by the Secret Service in America called Cyber MacGyver. And he took the 15-year-olds into, into the university program. Now, maybe Optus wants to sponsor something like this. Mm -hmm. so there you go. It's your next generation of workers but um, I don't know what to do with the current system. The current system does not allow me to do anything with them. Uh, we need some kind of collaboration with, with industry for s different kinds of apprenticeships. The place where I know this has been very successful, GCHQ in, 
in England, um, which is the secret organisation where it does technical spying kind of things. Um, they took a whole cohort of 50 people who had been um, young, old, been hairdressers and plumbers and trained them in cyber security and that's worked. And Narelle Devine, who is the CISO at Human Services, she's, and she came out of the Navy, I knew her then, and she's done the same. She's just brought people in from so many different directions, forgotten about having to have degrees. She does have graduates, but she has a whole group of other people who are not graduates. And I think that this is rather like a, an emergency situation. We're calling it war. Uh, we've got to think in the same way that we would think about what would we do if somebody was physically attacking us and, and to try to have those kinds of um, initiatives which will bring them in through different methods. Like a cyber army reserve. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're doing that. And we're doing that. <laughs> do we have any questions? Um, hi, my name is Bobby Jafari. I'm a um, La Trobe University graduate. I have one question and rather a comment. Uh, about something that I, uh, I've seen in this industry, in that um, when you look at privacy and, and security and the linkages between them, in a physical world, when um, we're being followed and tracked and monitored, if someone is constantly following our moves everywhere we go and, and tracking us, we call that stalking. And it's illegal to stalk someone. But in, an, in the online world, we're being stalked constantly, being being tracked. We've been tracked by, we're being tracked by cookies and tracking and analytics software for various platforms. And it's totally legitimate and unregulated. And this in itself leads to, in my opinion, to some security challenges and privacy challenges. And to your point of view, lack of regulation, there's no regulation around this. And, and what do you think is the solution? Um, we're not, you're not comparing apples with apples exactly because stalking involves a lot more than just following someone. But put that aside, um, obviously there's a disjunction between um, what happens um, in the physical universe and the cyber cyberspace. Um, our, our laws just uh, haven't kept up to date. So um, we need the G... We, we, we need something like... The, the general data protection regulation that's been brought into effect in Europe to apply in Australia. Like, that, that would get us part way down the track. Um, and what are the key points to that, to those rules? Uh, 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 much more consumer control, much more individual control over data. Um, an ability to opt out of automated data processing, that means um, an ability to opt out of some big data sort of stuff, the profiling that goes on with big data, um, rights to be forgotten, things like that. Um, but we also need much more effective regulation um, and um, more proactive regulators um, because it's very difficult. One of the problems in bringing a lawsuit um, is it's really hard to work out what damage has occurred to you. Like the 19.8 million accounts might all be in the dark web. Um, who knows, um, that it's actually really difficult to know what damage has, been accru has accrued to you. You just may have no idea about it. Um, and even if you do, it might be something that's... It's not like losing your leg. It's uh, losing your reputation or people finding out stuff about you or being you know, inconvenienced. So to go, to go back to your question, we need more, more effective laws. We need more effective regulators, um, but we need consequences. And at the moment, this space is consequence-less. Questions? Hi, uh, Olivier Walgraf. I just work for Victor Police. Um, just <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any sticky notes on your door? <laughs> <laughs> now that I know about that. Um, just... just you know, following on your, um, you know, there must be consequence. It's kind of interesting because we are just really trading all convenience and or wallets for actually a, a free for all thing. Because, you know, it, it's not really a step forward to think that the thermometer in the aquarium that was hacked is actually your thermometer in your house that is actually hacked and will actually just, you know, put to the max and just burn your house. So where is the regulation that just say, well, 
you as the thermometer provider that just, it's a $5 just gimmick, is actually liable for these kind of things. Mm. Oh, I can, I can answer yeah. that. Um, the, the American government has actually tried to put legislation into place where the, uh, the vendor of the IoT device who wants to sell it to the government has to actually prove that it's been tested. So that's, that's in a government context. Um, in Canberra, where I worked a bit, um, the, uh, what I heard from ASPE, which is the Strategic Policy Institute, that they were having working groups because uh, the Prime Minister had asked us to look at the very same issue. So they want to have... But what made me laugh, because I've got a strange sense of humour, is that we want the kangaroo ticks of approval. We're going to put kangaroos on IoT devices, like one kangaroo, two kangaroos, three kangaroos, because we're going to test all the devices to say if we're allowed to use them. So, but from a technical point of view, the feasibility of being able to test every single little device that we import from probably Southeast Asia is totally impossible. It's totally not feasible. And it's totally impossible to secure them. And I can give you that lecture another time. You just, you can't do it. Well, so, we've seen that just with toys, haven't we? Yeah. There's always at Christmas, there's all these toys which come in and you know you pull off the doll's head and there's a big spike sticking out of it. So even at the simplest of levels, yeah. trying to uh, field all of those things and uh, you know protect the Australian community from them is, is, is just an overwhelming task. It's, it's just impossible, as far as I'm concerned. But definitely no aquariums. <laughs> no. But the one I knew was, can uh, was uh, trackers that you put on cattle. So apparently you track cattle to do with milking, but I guess you wouldn't know where your cattle are. But it's internet enabled and somebody had done a denial of service attack through the, ca through the cattle trackers. I mean, I just found that just overwhelming, amusing, but very strange because we don't know how to fix it. Mm. I mean, of course, we had the issue of um, Huawei giving a whole bunch of MPs mobile phones, free mobile phones to use. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess that's a fairly extreme example of bringing devices into a, a, an institution. Well, I, I'm, I'm again going to make no comment about Huawei themselves, but uh, I, I think any vendor in the marketplace is always looking to seed technology. Uh, whether that technology has already been preceded with something uh, more nefarious is, uh, yeah, uh, again, subject to us making sure that we test these things, certainly before they get into the hands of politicians and uh, into the systems of um, the custodians of critical infrastructure. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the, um, speaking to the CEO of Telstra, um, Andy Pen a, a few months ago, he said the biggest threat to Telstra um, isn't something you know big and bold. Uh, it's just a couple of um, thumb drives left on left in the foyer yeah. at the Telstra office, and someone will innocently plug it into a computer to see whose it is. Well, and and so that you know that, that's uh, probably one of the, the key topics. Uh, you know, I, I know that I was speaking with my boss in Singapore the other day, and we were talking about the the skills shortage, and we. We surmised that to uh, our growth, to achieve our growth aspirations, we'd need to hire 16,000 people. Oh, sorry. And just, <laughs> well, uh, 9,000 was the Australian statement, but uh, 16,000, and, and it becomes ridiculous. And, and I guess um, uh, what we know is that awareness is the biggest challenge for us all. Uh, and so uh, Jill and I uh, have spoken with Gay Brotman, who's the uh, shadow minister for, for cyber. And I, I guess to draw parallel, Golly, I'm going on a limb here because I'm just making this up. But um, Gay, Gay is interested in creating awareness through something like a slip, slop, slap uh, uh, awareness campaign so that everyone starts to think, OK, what am I doing? I must change my behavior now. And, and so I guess you know, the parallel is, uh, should we be training lots of people to cut out melanomas, or should we be training people to not go out in the sun and overexpose themselves? And so I, th I think And so when it comes to data, you're saying, like, you know, if in doubt, don't plug it in. Absolutely. If in doubt, don't Absolutely. turn it on. Absolutely. Folks have got to realize that that's, you know, that's now one of the oldest tricks in the book. Mm. Uh, plug it in, and it says, you know, payroll.xls or something, or 
bosses' payroll, and mm -hmm. uh, of course they get suckered into it time and time again. We 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 use it as an exercise to uh, provide awareness to uh, to our customers. Uh, do exactly the same thing. Just walk in, leave the USB on the counter, of the receptionist desk, walk away, and uh, bingo, it phones home within moments uh, and lets us know that the receptionist plugged it in and took a peek. Um, and so we've got to make sure that uh, our users uh, are, are, are made aware of these things. Don't do this stuff. Don't be curious. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a big topic, and and I hope that we do uh, really get more successful in creating the right awareness campaigns for everyone uh, as an individual stakeholder, because they will then take those uh, reform behaviors back into the corporate, into their corporate lives, uh, and consider their corporations as well, and think a little bit more about uh, you know what they're doing uh, with their systems. Um, and even to the extent of just not letting somebody tailgate you through um, uh, through the uh, physical uh, door access systems, um, because of course we we know that uh, that's a heavy contributor to the loss of information. We we will uh, red team people, and uh, you know we'll we'll put the person in the pencil skirt with the boxes, you know, shuddering towards the door. I think so that's, that's called entrapment. Yes, but, uh, you know, <laughs> they'll, they'll hold the door open every time and let that person in. So we've just got to make everyone uh, more aware and take a zero trust approach, which is unfortunate, but it's, uh, it's just a reality of life nowadays. Questions? Yep, I'm Tom, I've got an IT company. Can I ask you, each member, what operating system are you using? on your computer? <laughs> um, I've got Windows and a Mac. I've got, I've got a, f a few computers. Windows 10? Um, whatever the university supports. <laughs> uh, Ted, Ted. That's the greatest fire is available. Um, hi, Sierra. Hi. Uh, yes, the latest Mac uh, OS. Uh, hi, PhD candidate, La Trobe University. Um, we're talking about the human element, the human aspect of these problems. And it occurred to me that one aspect of this is the infrastructure in terms of the media, the media infrastructure. Uh, we're talking about how we can get people to, or the public, to recognise the threat, to understand the problems, to adopt. Uh, slip, slop, slap, I think. Yep. How do we get that to work when in the current situation, which is, as I understand it, is uh, media infrastructure is, is, or trust in it, is somewhat shaky or unstable. So perhaps a uh, first step is uh, addressing that instability, those, those issues in public trust in those institutions, in the institutions in the infrastructure that we need to make the slip, slop, slap strategies work. And do we have any research that's approaching? Jill, did you want to... Do you mean the media that? like newspapers and... All kinds. <sighs> Particularly new media that I have in mind, I'm thinking in terms of websites, social media. I'm thinking media. of your PhD, actually, but, yeah. <laughs> um, I... I have good, really good relationships with people in the media, and I've, I've found that what I, I believe is needed is an education process, and that's what we used to actually do when I was at UNSW Canberra, is that we would actually be willing to educate, as it were, the, the, the parliamentary media, because um, there's absolutely no reason why a, a, a young journalist should actually know what I know. So even now, I still get phone calls from people who, who are quite senior, and they'll just come and ask me questions about what do you think about this and what, I've, what does this mean and what are the implications of this. So I, I don't have a deep suspicion. I mean, I, I have deep suspicions of Cambridge Analytica and, and Mark Zuckerberg and things like that, but the actual journalists that we have here in Australia, I only have really good uh, relationships with people because they, uh, they want to know, and I just think that people like all of us can be explainers. That's, that's what I call it, explaining. Uh, I think I've got that from Questacon, but it's, we need explainers of, of the technology to, to the media. We need to keep explaining what, why we're using this parallel of slip, slop, slap, which I'm not totally keen on the expression, but I, I'm, exp <laughs> I'm keen on the concept. So I think we're in the position to educate, and that's what I think you should be doing too with, with your studies, is to keep educating, really. Is that okay? <laughs> there was a question up the back. 
Hi, um, I'm a public servant for the Victorian States. Um, so by the way, we run uh, Windows 7 on our uh, machines. <laughs> uh, one of my questions is, I keep on hearing kind of a bashing on the uh, Chinese state, and when you look at um, what um, ch chips are actually on those Chinese phones, they're not made by Chinese company, they're actually American. Uh, as far as we know, Chinese don't make microprocessor, AMD, Intel, uh, they're not Chinese. Um, so when we rent servers to run the state of Victoria or other public utilities, they're all going uh, through data center in Sydney, Amazon, or Microsoft One. So <laughs> when I look at it, everything is going through um, American company, American engineers. Uh, so why there's so much fear on, on like Chinese company when they're actually mostly buying components from all over the world and putting it together and ship it somewhere else. So is it really founded to fear China? Um, I, I think the question that um, was posed before was whether, um, whether Huawei should have um, a role in 5G. Um, uh, um, I've given an answer to that, which is not a technological answer. Um, it's a legal answer, and it seems to me that it that it's an entirely, um, entirely appropriate and actually answers the question. Um, I don't know if uh, Intel chips run through Amazon and provide our information back to the CIA. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think it's um, uh, you know, it kind of goes back to uh, what I was saying earlier, where um, everybody's doing it um, because there is you know potential game, uh, potential gain. Uh, you know, if, if you consider uh, that there is an opportunity to uh, create some gain uh, by understanding more through, um, you know, espionage, through uh, listening uh, and uh, understanding uh, everything that's going on in an all-pervasive manner, um, then it's it's just as likely that it is uh, what we would refer to as a friendly uh, is is creating this capability as uh, as you know perhaps uh, an organisation or a state which is uh, not regarded as a friendly. So um, yeah, I, I think it's easy to grab the handle and sort of you know point to an organisation like Huawei or point uh, to our neighbours up north and say, you know, they're, they're the enemy. But uh, certainly it's, it's the capability which is being created by everybody uh, that we need to be concerned about. So, you know, I, I don't think there's any good guys or bad guys. There's just folks creating capability that we need to be aware of and it can be used for good or evil. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, you go back to uh, the ASD's mantra, which is to reveal their secrets and protect our own. Uh, even Australia will use whatever measures they can to gain the advantage that they're looking for. So uh, I think also we must add, we are part of the Five Eyes Alliance. So like it or not, our government has decided that America and Canada and Britain and New Zealand are our friends. Yes. Um, we're not saying they are better than anybody else in their behaviour. We're just saying this is the political alliance within which we work. We do not have that same kind of alliance with China. We don't have the same relationship with the EU. Um, but we, do, we have to uh, honour and support what we've got. And so this is how I've, I've approached my whole career. So, yeah, uh, I, I don't think actually China's the enemy at all. Half of my family's Chinese and adopted, so, and, and I speak Chinese very fluently. Um, uh, but, uh, and I have spent a lot of my research time in China, but I have also seen the, um, the, the chips which have been produced, which are al already they already have the phone home ability inside them. I've seen it with my own eyes, so don't think Huawei made them, but somebody did. So do you think that, I mean, going on that question, do you think there's so much focus on China and, and the, Huawei is one reason for that, that we're potentially focusing too much on that and not enough on the fact that threats could come from other countries Absolutely and elsewhere anywhere. and other ac and other actors? Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we, we, we need to assume uh, 
um, that mm. uh, all things from everywhere mm. uh, have the potential to be used against us. Mm. Uh, but also for an academic, it actually destroys collaboration because there's a Chinese uh, female professor at one of the Chinese academies of science. We have had very similar careers. And, and we've got to the stage now when we see each other at conferences, and I've been in China a couple of years ago, we don't dare talk about what we're doing because we both know that we both work with our governments and we're not allowed to do that conversation. And it's really sort of uh, stunted the relationship totally because uh, we can't actually share our research unless we both published it and put it somewhere where we can talk about it. And nowadays, we're probably not, we're probably not doing that because there's so much suspicion. And um, that sort of is totally opposite to what we were originally taught as academics mm. as well. And so, so I've, I've made this comment in, in many places. It just changes the whole nature of academia because collaboration is gone. I think from a, from a business perspective, um, we are always looking at threat intelligence and what the different threat actors are doing and there are many, many organisations actively watching and listening and sharing intelligence um, in this domain and I think, you know, for, for the businesses it's, it's, it's less about the who but the you know, the what. I mean, it, I'm not saying the who is unimportant, but, you know, what is going on? What are some of the techniques that are being used actively? And, you know, um, are we exposed? What do we need to do? Any more questions? Down here. Thanks. My name's Greg. Uh, previously from the banking industry, which has had some interesting um, investigations recently. But my question's in two parts. The first one ties in with what you were just saying regarding um, having a joint standard that it looks and sounds like from everything we've talked about tonight, we've moved from a physical world into a virtual world of security that we need to maintain and that we can, I guess, feel that maybe we're in striking distance globally anywhere in the world. So for us to get a, a solution that's, I guess, comprehensive and... Um, has the integrity that we need. We need to sort of consider having a global united alliance with other countries and other political powers and even multinational companies to get together in task force to determine what the universal standards should be globally that we need to be accountable to. And then that comes in with what we were talking earlier about consequences. If one part of the world are neglectful in those approaches, then the rest of the world in some ways becomes the weakest link and exposed. So my question is, is there any best practice that's out there at the moment that you feel is, is doing it really well, leading the world in this type of work? And is there a push towards governments? Obviously, we've only got our own immediate political alliances, but is there a move towards generating a sort of more universal level of um, control over the standards that need to be maintained? And a second question I'll just throw in at the end is the other thing that concerns me is um, the artificial intelligence um, part of this, that the next level, as I see it, is that we've got to also put some controls into place to regulate the artificial intelligence components that are coming into our world, which are now becoming such a large part of all industries. They're automating, their innovation is just accelerating at such an exponential rate that... I'm sure everyone's seen the movie Terminator and the Skynet proposition where we get concerned about computers getting to a point where we don't have regulation over what they're actually doing. And that really worries me because if we get to a point where computers are actually no longer solely controlled by us as humans, then I know this is far-fetched and in the future, but it is something that we've got to start thinking about. So they're the two questions. All right, let's, let's start with the second one. Um, Megan, what are your thoughts on AI and how cognizant corporations are of, of what the responsibilities are around that? So it's 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 emerging. It's it's a new um, way of of doing things. Okay, our technology is moving at a pace. Our challenge is to position security so that it is front of mind, not left to, to the afterthought. So, you know, when it comes to the design of AI, thinking about and embedding 
um, security is is important. And I think from our perspective, it is um, it follows this concept of <coughs> security by design. So it's very much at the forefront of um, the 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 development life cycle mm. as opposed to the afterthought. One, one of the challenges we've got is that we're, we're constantly in this kind of arms race. Uh, when you were talking about Terminator just now, I, I was uh, visiting with Vic Rhodes the other day and we were just talking about the uh, adoption of drones. Uh, and um, uh, somehow I distracted them and talked to them about um, this clip which you can now Google, which is called uh, Slaughterbots. Uh, so Google Slaughterbots, it's, a, it's an interesting um, uh, sort of hypothetical clip uh, about drones which have the ability to deal with sieges, uh, where the drone has artificial intelligence, uh, and facial recognition, uh, and could be assigned to deal with something like the Lint Cafe siege. Mm -hmm. It can zip in, it's got a small explosive <coughs> uh, charge uh, built into it, lands on your head, boom, uh, takes out the, the perpetrator. And so the story goes that, uh, of course, this is created uh, by the government to deal with siege conditions and uh, you know armed holdups and all this sort of thing, and of course that technology gets stolen, yeah. and so you get that into the wrong hands. Mm. Then what happens? Uh, suddenly you've got these fleets of, and and so again it sounds far fetched, but of course when you look at artificial intelligence and drone technology and all of these things, it doesn't take that long before you start to go, mm, okay, I wonder if that already exists. And so we find ourselves constantly in this arms race where artificial intelligence will soon be used against us by the bad guys. Uh, I was with a government uh, agency the other day and they said to me, you know, whatever we put in, we must assume that within weeks, months, years, it will be compromised and used against us. So, you know, there is just this awareness mm -hmm. that we've got to constantly try and stay ahead. So I, I certainly see artificial intelligence and machine learning as a massive solution for us to reduce the unit cost of delivering cybersecurity to our customers. But we know that it's going to be turned back on us uh, in no time, and artificial intelligence and machine learning will look uh, for new methods to compromise uh, compromise our clients and you know our critical systems. As we're running almost out of time, I'll skip to the first question now and ask the two of you: Is there a gold standard out there in the world for digital defenders? Not for cyber. Or not for cyber at the moment. So there's the Budapest Convention on Cyber Crime, um, the EU Convention also on Cyber Crime, and there's also the Talon Principles um, 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 that relate to the transfer of um, uh, the, the physical world principles of international law and warfare into cyber, the cyber, the cyber realm. Um, Many people say um, that you know, the age of big treaties is over because we just can't agree on anything. Um, so you'll probably see international consensus around some of these issues emerge out of um, uh, principles or guidelines, etc., etc., that agree, are agreed by the EU or by you know, particular regional organisations. Jill, gold no. standard out there? There's no gold standard for for legislation regulation. There's meant to be a gold standard certification because mm. I have one of them, but um, that's just a snapshot in time of what mm. we need to know to fix things now. That and, but outside of legislation, is is there is there a, an organisation? Is there a government? Is there a company? Is there anyone who's doing this brilliantly? I'll go back to Narelle Devine and Human Services. She's looking after all the Centrelink, all the Medicare, all the all the money, uh, and she's not getting breached, as far as I know. Well, there you are. And, and she sees a lot of things. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> That's where the money is, so, uh, yes, they, they throw everything at her. Yes, they do, they do. She's, uh, and being able to do, do that and do it well is, she's an Australian example, and um, so in, in federal um, capture the flag kind of competitions, her team won. Her team of all these odds and ends of people from all different backgrounds, graduates, non-graduates, they beat everybody else. So I would hold her up as an example of good practice. I hope that answered your questions. We are out of time. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Please thank the panel. Professor Jill Slay, <laughs> David Watts, Simon Ratcliffe and Megan Haas.
This, of course, was part of La Trobe University's Bold Thinking series. There is many more coming up this year. The next one is in August, titled The War on Youth. So please come along to that one as well. Thank you so much.